the Doctor, featuring Southwest Florida's leading physicians, hosted by Dr. Gregory Leach and Jim York. Good evening and welcome once again to uh, Dialogue with the Doctor. And we're welcoming back Dr. Raymond Phillips, who's a practicing gastroenterologist in Naples, Florida. He's been on the show before, and we like having him because he has a lot to say. This evening, we're talking about irritable bowel syndrome, also sort of called inflammatory bowel disease. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. That's the subject. But we've all heard of colitis and those entities, but that, that's the category we're talking about this evening. We'd like to welcome you back. And I know you've been on before, but I'd like to just tell us a little bit about yourself, your oh, sure, background. Jim. Sure, Jim. Well, as you know, I'm a board-certified gastroenterologist. The, um, and to achieve that, I mean, I went to a college at Princeton University, and uh, I attended Princeton on an ROTC scholarship. And, um, and later, uh, I, I went into the Army. But after Princeton, I went to Washington University uh, Medical School. And from there, I went to Philadelphia, attended Jeff I went to uh, Jefferson Hospital. And there I did my um, uh, medical residency for three years. And the fourth year I was chief, selected to be chief resident. It was that point I went in the Army on active duty and I was assigned to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. And uh, at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri for two years I was an internist. Uh, I was then um, selected at, uh, to go to Walter Reed for gastroenterology training. Uh, and after two years of training at Walter Reed, I was then selected to be on the staff at Walter Reed, where I was there for an additional two years. And while there, I was assistant chief of the department, but also assistant professor of medicine at the Uniform Services for Health Sciences at Bethesda. And in 1991, I came on down here to practice, and, they, um, and I practiced with Dr. Lerberski, Dr. Randall, uh, Dr. Marks, as well as uh, Dr. Katie. And your offices are located? Yeah, our office is on Colonial Square, 1064 Goodlett Road, downtown. And we have a satellite office in, uh, in Bonita as well as in Marco Island. So, so tell us a little bit about it, um, inflammatory bowel disease, what it is, and et cetera. Well, inflammatory bowel disease uh, is, is, the, is the general terminology we're talking about. But over the years, it had been described as colitis, inflammation of the colon, uh, and the, the name had been kind of vague, but just referring to a collection of symptoms um, uh, of urgency, diarrhea, bleeding. Uh, and over the years, it became clear, particularly in the 1930s, that there were two varieties of inflammatory bowel disease. There's a variety that uh, came to be known as Crohn's disease, uh, named after a Dr. Crohn in the 1930s. And then uh, at the same time, it was recognized as other entity called ulcerative colitis. The two are distinguished from one another in that ulcerative colitis is just an inflammation of the colon, and Crohn's disease is an inflammation that can involve the colon, but the entire GI tract. Now, hardly anyone knew about inflammatory bowel disease, and the only ones who cared were their, the patients or their families and their doctors until the 1950s when President Eisenhower, he came uh, to, to be diagnosed with Crohn's disease. And uh, it was a difficult time uh, for him because he had a very, very severe variety of Crohn's disease that led to obstruction, a small bowel intestinal blockage. He was hospitalized at Walter Reed for six weeks, lost 40, 50 pounds. It culminated in an operation in 1956 um, where the, um, there was a debate intraoperatively about what was the best kind of operation for the President of the United States. And there was discussion between the Chief of Surgery about uh, doing a particular operation, and, and they called in the Chief of Gastroenterology at Walter Reed for his opinion about what would be the appropriate operation. Well, with the President's open abdomen, they had quite a discussion about what was the appropriate operation. And the surgeon said, by God, I'm going to do the surgeon surgery I've been trained to do. And he did his surgery, and fortunately, it's successful. It wasn't the surgery that the gastroenterologist recommended. The surgeon went on to become Surgeon General of the United States. The gastroenterologist was assigned to a place out in Alaska. <laughs> so the, uh, uh, there's consequences sometimes of making the, the right recommendation. Uh, but the... Uh, at any rate, after that, Crohn's disease became very well known, and uh, with the availability of cortisone in the 1950s, the discovery of it, and the availability of anti-inflammatories, uh, uh, oral ones such as salvasalazine, sulfasalazine, there was for the first time therapy for both of these conditions, and it was thought we had a cure, that with the, the steroids that we could cure this, 
and it became pretty clear quickly that steroids were a little bit of a trap. You can improve the symptoms, but you would not cure an individual. And, and the individual would invariably relapse again and suffer all the consequences and side effects of steroids. And over these last 40 years, therapy has not been that successful because we didn't have a very good understanding about what was causing uh, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, and which I'll now just call inflammatory bowel disease. We didn't really have a good understanding of what was provoking it, so the therapy was a little bit haphazard. Uh, and then, um, but we did understand that there was the immune system that was provoking this inflammation, your immune system believing there was an infection or something not right within the GI tract attacking that area, leading to inflammation, uh, and using drugs uh, like steroids, or but uh, more recently drugs like 6 mercaptopurine azathioprine, it was shown we could calm down the immune system. And then very, very detailed studies of the immune system were then done in the 1990s that finally led to the development of more successful drugs here in the 2000s. Um, these drugs being a, a totally different class of medication. Uh, one's called Remicade, the other's called Himera, and we'll talk more about that in just a bit. Uh, but the theme I wanted to get as, as we did basic science and understood how the immune system uh, was the stimulus and the cause for this inflammation and what was driving this inflammation, uh, a number of studies were looking at it uh, and trying to discover what was the trigger, what provoked this inflammation, what sustained it. And the, the theories that had been present for years, oh, that this was a psychological issue or that there was deep interpersonal problems that provoked this and manifested in the GI tract, it, it came to be realized that this just wasn't uh, uh, the full issue. Stress could trigger problems but was not the cause uh, of the, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Smoking or any of that? Well, a number of things were uh, some of things were looked at. A right. number of things were looked at. Everything was looked at okay. because the understanding was so poor. Ethnicity, smoking, um, uh, living conditions, latitude, many, many different things were looked at. And a number of trends developed. Uh, ethnicity seemed to play a, a role initially. That is to say, Jewish populations were affected uh, more predominantly. But that's become less and less of an issue. Uh, it, it seemed to be a, a function of latitude. The further north you lived, the more frequent it was. Uh, it seemed to occur in the big city rather than in, on the farm or out on, on, on a smaller envi or, uh, environments, uh, less urban environments. Uh, and so a lot of confusing factors. Smoking seemed to be, uh, uh, I hate to say it, beneficial uh, in, some, in some ways, but uh, at least for ulcerative colitis. But, so the, the, the difficulty with this is that uh, the understanding wasn't there. There was no unifying theme until we had a better uh, uh, and more clarity as far as the role that the immune system plays. And, and the, the role the immune system plays is most of your immune system, like 90%, is directed toward your GI tract. And it was clear uh, that your GI tract is, uh, is the frontier, if you will, where most of your body's immune system directs its effort. And it was becoming increasingly clear there was some type of abnormal reaction or response that was triggering the immune system and then leading to a sustained uh, stimulus of the immune system. And then in the 1990s, uh, this particular hypothesis was developed called the hygienic hypothesis. Mm -hmm. uh, the hygienic hypothesis is a, um, a notion that perhaps the environment we live in, the amount of of exposure to different antigens and bacteria and so forth may well uh, prime an individual uh, to develop this uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, and to sort of develop that statement more fully, in places of the world where there is less hygiene, if you will, uh, where you know, water treatment, food treatment, sewage treatment was poor, uh, it was found that, gee, inflammatory bowel disease is exceedingly rare. Whereas in the United States, where these particular issues in terms of water treatment, sewage treatment, and food treatment has improved over the last 100 years, the incidence of inflammatory bowel disease has in turn exploded. So whereas in the early 1900s, inflammatory bowel disease was very rare, mm -hmm. in the order of one out of 100,000, two out of 100,000, now it's like one out of 100. So it's extremely common. 
So it's thought that if an, a child was born in an environment where they were exposed to more bacteria, that potentially that might diminish the activity of the immune system, and then there wouldn't be as a vigorous response of the immune system that would uh, in turn lead to the development of this inflammation uh, uh, within the GI tract. So that hypothesis was called the hygienic hypothesis, or uh, to summarize it a little bit, little Johnny was not allowed to play in the mud puddle, and, and as a result, when he grew up, he, uh, he didn't expose to a lot of different germs and was more susceptible to inflammatory bowel disease. Is this more prevalent in people that have had transplants that are on immune? No, no, no. not necessarily, no. And they're immune uh, suppressed, That's as right, you know, they are. And, uh, and so it's, it's less common in those individuals, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so. Uh, so is this still a, a hypothesis, or do we, do we well, really think no, that that plays yeah, a role? It really does seem to play a role. And, and, and uh, I won't go into the scientific details, but as a result of this, a number of studies have been initiated uh, using this as a basis. Uh, and the, one of the markers, if you will, of hygiene is the presence of various parasites within the uh, gastrointestinal system. And when these parasites were looked at in more detail, is found they have a very sophisticated system to modulate the host immune system. They're able to interact and downregulate the host immune system, uh, calm it down, if you will, so, so that it creates an environment that allows this parasite to live. And in environments where parasites are common, inflammatory bowel disease is, is exceedingly rare. So preliminary studies have been done and now are being done on a widespread basis. They're called phase three studies and we're participating in one of those studies where we're actually using a particular variety of microscopic parasite whose host is, the, but by giving it to humans, it, it's been demonstrated in preliminary studies to actually calm down the immune system and to be a means of treating um, inflammatory bowel disease. And in this case, the study is looking at Crohn's disease. And, um, and the, the studies look very, very promising. Now, there's some details that, uh, that have been worked out. You know, in this particular parasite that we're participating on is a parasite, it's called the pig whipworm, and it's specific for pigs. The host is not the human, and so this particular, um, uh, particular parasite cannot endure and live within a human more than a few days or a week or two. Uh, but during that time it does exist, it seems to calm down the immune system. And we're looking at a, a phase three study, and we're participating in that study, uh, comparing individuals who have Crohn's disease, um, those individuals, half of them will receive placebo and half will re receive a, um, a, 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 these microscopic parasites. And we'll follow them over time and see what kind of response they have. So in, in those cases, or as in this experimentation, is the logic eventually to figure out what the paras what type of down regulators the parasite is, are making so that you can then make and, a drug from that? Or? Well, yes, and that has been, that's another strategy that has been looked at, is that uh, in order for the immune system to cause inflammation, it has to release certain messengers to recruit white blood cells to an area where the immune system believes is a problem. By interfering with those messages, uh, white blood cells don't have the direction as far as where to go. It's just like a general directing a number of troops on a battlefield and they, if you can block the radio transmissions, then there's no way for messages to go to the soldiers to go to a particular location. And similarly in this circumstance, and using that kind of strategy, uh, particular messages have been blocked and that's what led to the development of the drug called Remicade, uh, as well as another drug called Humira. Now interestingly, the, those drugs have been used in other inflammatory conditions, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, but also in, in inflammatory bowel disease. The interesting aspect about parasites is that it seems to be more specific uh, for, uh, for inflammatory bowel disease. And yes, indeed, there is some relationship between the parasite and its release of certain chemicals to interact with the host and the uh, uh, immune system, and that's being studied closely as well. But, you know, the, the parasites have had millions of years to get it just right. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not like one chemical or one, mm -hmm. it's multitude of interactions that are, are occurring 
between the parasite and the host. So it probably won't be able to be synthesized to one message or one, uh, one therapy, but that's being studied in close detail. Yeah, yeah, well, you, you like to understand what you're <laughs> doing and not just say, hey, gee, that works. And, and, uh, well, it's complex, so <laughs> I guess the parasite wants to be able to live there and not kill the host by making well, it. Well, that's exactly right. Create a nice little environment <laughs> so you can live and not, not, uh, not, not create a unhappy environment. But you know, that, that's just one example of, of some of the efforts that have been made as a result of understanding the immune system. Now we have many other uh, therapies. You know, we're looking at a study using herbal therapy with ginseng and Sichuan pepper. Um, but gonna, there's other therapies that are more conventional. Uh, we're going to take a short break. All right. And all then right. we'll let you continue okay, there. So, right. we're, so we'll take a short break uh, and for some information uh, for you all, and then we'll come back for, with uh, Dr. Phillips. Okay. I had been a, a practicing orthopedic surgeon for a number of years, and I thought that I was invincible to the multitude of medical problems I saw around me every day. I uh, was quite shocked when I received a phone call telling me that I had cancer of the prostate. Dr. David Spellberg of Naples Urology Associates is the local specialist in treating prostate cancer with the new CyberKnife radiation treatment. Once I got myself together, was to do as much research as I could, and what I was looking for was a treatment that would give me the least risk of complications and side effects. And that's where the CyberKnife came into the picture. Advanced CyberKnife technology, precise. It sends just the right dose of radiation to the cancerous areas fast. Each treatment is only one hour, non-invasive. This outpatient procedure has almost no side effects. The day after my treatment, I was out playing golf, and I'm looking forward now to continuing to enjoy a long and happy and comfortable life thanks to the care of my team of doctors and to the CyberKnife procedure. Learn more about CyberKnife and Dr. Spellberg. Call today. Welcome back to Dialogue with the Doctor. We just took a short break and we're back with Dr. Raymond Phillips and we're talking this evening with Dr. Phillips, a gastroenterologist, about inflammatory bowel disease. So let's pick up where we left off. Well, it, it, we, we were talking a moment ago about therapy in general and how it's been gui guided by successes as far as understanding what provokes or what causes inflammatory bowel disease and with that understanding, drugs like Remicade and Humira have been developed that are very effective. Uh, other drugs that are being developed are looking at other means of controlling the inflammation in the GI tract. Of course, you know, we have uh, uh, medications uh, such as you know, Azacol, Lealda, Dipentum, you know, Aprizo. These are all medications that are effective for reducing inflammation and uh, they're actually time release devices that allow these anti-inflammatory medication, uh, the active ingredient from all of them is the same, it's called mesalamine, but it reduces inflammation of the lining of the GI tract, either the small intestine or the colon itself. And, um, and it's been useful, but what we realized that just reducing inflammation by itself uh, was not really sufficient to really control this, and that because the immune system was what drives this and leads to that inflammation, it was uh, with that understanding now that we've directed therapy toward also trying to modulate the immune system. The trouble is, is that when you use medications that, um, that modulate the immune system, that calm it down, your immune system is not there just for fun. It's there to look out for the presence of infections, to defeat any kind of cancer cells that might develop over time. And so there's the legitimate concern that using these medications might place an individual at higher risk for infections or potentially different forms of cancer. Uh, and that had been the theoretical concern. You know, and the issues with regard to infection, yes, there's a slightly higher risk of infection, so we have to be on the alert uh, for that. Fungal infections in particular or tuberculosis, and those things have to be screened for reactivation of certain types of viruses, hepatitis C or B, for example. But the, um, uh, the issue in terms of the potential of making individuals susceptible toward cancer has been a great concern with these new medications. And although a great concern, the reality is that just the incidence is not that much higher with these medications. There is a background rate 
of a higher risk of cancer in the setting of inflammatory bowel disease. Because as I said, it's an activation of the immune system, and that activation can make an individual more susceptible to a form of cancer called lymphoma. So the risk with a, if a, for an individual with inflammatory bowel disease is about three in 10,000 of developing a lymphoma. Um, and so uh, if you begin a therapy like Humira or Remicade for inflammatory bowel disease, that risk might go up to five in 10,000. So it does increase the risk, uh, in a, but the risk is not that much higher in, term, in absolute terms um, than the background rate that would occur. So a lot of individuals, though, focus in on that, and they uh, get very, very concerned about that. And it's a concern for the physicians as well. But inflammatory bowel disease is not a trivial disease. It, it can be absolutely debilitating. As, and, uh, and it can kill an individual. And although there's operations that can be done that, can, that are very successful, and also of colitis, if you remove the colon, you're cured of colitis, then you're left with whole new uh, issues in terms of, uh, in the absence of a colon, uh, there's accommodations that need to be made uh, in, in terms of living with a, either a, a ileostomy or, or having a new, newly constructed um, 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 uh, operation that allows a new rectum to be formed. Um, or in Crohn's disease, operations that can be done to remove the area of Crohn's disease. But, you know, operations have been come to realize, at least in the context of Crohn's disease, not to be curative because if you remove an area of inflammation in Crohn's disease, it will come back at the site of that same operation in a few years' time. Indeed, within a few months' time, there's signs of recurrence of the Crohn's disease at a site of a previous operation. So it's realized that an operation would not be itself sufficient in the context of Crohn's disease to be able to be curative. Now, of course, I mentioned President Eisenhower there earlier. That was an operation to save his life. That was not an operation to cure him. And so that was a, a different setting there. So it can reoccur then? Yes, it can indeed. Okay. So the medicines that you're using today, the, the anti-inflammatories uh, anti and now the anti-immune system drugs, are those the only two categories that, that you have right now? Well, the, um, the, the more precise thing, the, these drugs that are called biologics, and mm -hmm. what I mean by biologics is that they are constructed medications. They're actually antibodies that seek out and latch on to messages, as I was talking to you before. Mm -hmm. The normal messages your, body, your body's immune system sends. So antibodies are constructed to those messenger uh, molecules and they block them. And so these drugs are called biologics and they're called anti-TNF or tumor necrosis factor. And that's what they do, they're antibodies that seek out tumor necrosis factor, block it, and prevent that message from going forward uh, to activate the immune system. The, um, that's one whole category that are called biologics. Uh, and among those biologics are other types of antibodies that are being developed that are, have not yet been released. Another whole category of medications that calm down the immune system are drugs are called sixmercaptopurine or azathioprine. These medications actually modulate the entire immune system, uh, calm it down, as you were. Formerly, they were used as chemotherapeutic drugs in the 1960s and 70s, and we got better drugs. And then we realized these drugs in tiny doses can have this effect on the immune system. So they've uh, been uh, used more, more recently in the last 15 years for that purpose. So are, are we, has the probability of, of a, pa a patient who gets Crohn's disease, for example, and ends up having surgery, are we reducing the probability of surgery with the drugs that we're using now? Have we reduced uh, the incidence of? The preliminary studies, yes, indeed, show that, uh, that these biologic drugs, in Remicade and Mira, uh, as well as these drugs, uh, Sixmercaptopurine and Azathioprine, have led to a decrease uh, need for uh, surgery mm -hmm. and operations. And, and so over the last 15 years, that's been reflected in a decreased number of operations being done, colectomies being performed. Uh, and so there, that has a substantial change mm -hmm. uh, over these last 10, 15 years. Who, who is more likely to get these inflammatory diseases? Women, men? Is it anybody? 
at any time of life? Well, the, um, each gender is affected equally. Okay. The, um, there, there seems to be two age distributions when inflammatory bowel disease uh, appears. Uh, young adults, adolescents or young adults, and then another peak later in life in the, in the 50s and 60s is the two age groups where it, uh, it seems to, uh, to be more common, but it can occur at any age. Uh, it's rare after the age of 70, but it can occur. It can occur. For, for, for my patients or our common patients that mm -hmm. come, in, come in and they may have gastrointestinal complaints, uh, recurrent but not frequent, uh, how, do, how, do, how do we speak to those patients about whether or not they have such an entity? If somebody comes in and says, you know, I have, I have a, an, an irritable incident every five years that lasts six weeks. I mean, do they have irritable, you know, what? Well, you, and you're basically asking, hey, what how should they, would, would alert a person to, yes. to really be concerned, yes. to ring it up with their physician? And the, um, and the kind of symptoms that would really be a concern was a clear-cut change in bowel habits that goes on for weeks and weeks, where before maybe one or two movements a day, and now it's three or four or five urgent movements, increased incidence of passage of mucus, presence of passage of blood, you know, having instances of incontinence, not being able to control you know, uh, the, the movement and before having an urgent evacuation. One, uh, one key marker is actually waking up at nighttime to have bowel movements. That is distinctly unusual and, and it's not a stress-related event. Mm -hmm. um, irritable bowel syndrome, as you mentioned, is a condition where you can frequently have more frequent bowel movements, but when you go to sleep, it goes away. Oh, uh, inflammatory bowel disease doesn't matter whether you're asleep. You will still have instances of diarrhea. So if you have nighttime awakening, uh, more frequent movements compared to before, it's sustained over a period of several weeks, yeah, it deserves attention. Now, all of us on occasion will get a gastrointestinal infection that's been studied. There's 1.7 intestinal infections per American per year where you'll get diarrhea that might last for several days, and then um, your immune system defeats the infection and you get back to normal. And, and so when I'm talking about sustained symptoms going on for a period of several weeks, it would really prompt you to discuss with your physician, hey, what should I do to evaluate this further? We'd like to thank you for coming this evening talking about irritable bowel and Crohn's disease and inflammatory bowel disease. And um, hopefully you'll come back again. Yep. Well, I certainly will. You know, gastrointestinal like ailments is just a, is so frequent across the United States, and we'll, we'll be discussing other topics in the future, irritable bowel syndrome, celiac disease, um, okay. gluten intolerance. So it just the... Uh, celiac is a common one. Oh, oh, yeah. That's a big one. You know, uh, based on uh, are we done? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Based on what you're saying, I'm not.